Hey, welcome to part seven of the functions as series video series. Today we're going to be looking at e to the x and its many forms. So let's jump into a review of where we stopped in the last video. We talked about the Maclaurin expansion, which can also be or called the Taylor series expansion centered at zero. Or you just call it the Maclaurin series that's a specific type with a specific value of x. So the idea here being that you're always going to write x to the power of and k factorial, that'll be constant. So you can always start out by writing these terms out here because those will always be included in your series. The only thing you're responsible for filling in is the kth derivative evaluated at zero for each term as the coefficient. And the easiest way to sort of organize your thoughts for this is to do a graphic organizer as shown here. For example, if we're looking at a Maclaurin for cosine, we do the zeroth derivative, which is the original function, and then we start taking the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so on. And from there, you're going to end up wanting to know the value at zero. So if you plug in zero into each of these derivatives, you're going to get a value. This value from your table represents these coefficients in the Maclaurin expansion. So that should make it pretty easy as a systematic way to do these quickly and accurately. And so if you notice that these coefficients are 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, the zeros are always going to occur in the odd powers, leaving only the even function or even termed powers, which is good because we know cosine is an even function. Similarly for sine, you get the zeros for every even-powered term, which leaves only the odd-powered terms left with alternating signs, and that's good because sine is an odd function. And of course, e to the x derivative is always e to the x, and e to the x at zero is always one. So you just plug in one as every coefficient, and you get every term of the series. So as a brief recap, you'll see here we arrived at three very common Maclaurin series that you need to have memorized. You see the coefficients here being plugged in, and we get all the even powers over the even factorials with alternating signs. For sine, we see the coefficients of the even terms are zero, leaving only the odd terms and alternating sign. And then e to the x has a 1 for every single term. So that's where we kind of left off. And at this point, you should have some sort of spider sense tingling. Because e to the x is so common, you've seen it in many applications up to this point. You know, especially when you're looking at compounding interest continuously. That e naturally arrives in the p e to the rt formula, commonly called PERT. And when you were looking at PERT, you saw this limit definition for E. And if E is this, we want a representation for E to the X. So how do we go from an E to an E to the X representation? Well, if you start with E, which is the limit of 1 plus 1 over N to the N power, and you raise that whole thing to the X power, well, we can pull the limit out. That's a nice property of limits. You can do the limit of the a to the power, or you can do the limit of the whole thing together. And then you can multiply these exponents using the property of exponents. And this would suffice as a good definition, limit definition for e to the x, but this is not what's commonly written. So from here, we're going to do a clever u substitution. We're going to substitute that u is in x. So you'll notice that in x is now u. And we know that as n approaches infinity, u must also approach infinity because x is constant. So here we'll see that n approaching infinity becomes u approaching infinity. And if nx equals u, then 1 divided by u n becomes x over u. So 1 over n becomes x over u. So a more common way to write e to the x would be this limit as u approaches infinity of 1 plus x over u to the u. And without losing any logical steps here, we're going to change our u's to n's 
just for uh, being common with our E function here. So we now have a representation for E to the X using a limit definition, but we just showed in the previous clip that there was a series expansion for E to the X. So how, how is that possible that we have these two very different definitions for E to the X? So we have to be asking ourselves, is this limit definition equivalent to the series expansion definition? And that's actually your first practice for this video. Can we show that these are actually equivalent? Now, before you go embark on your adventure here, I have some necessary tools, just a quick review for you. You are going to need the combinations formula, commonly called n choose k, where that's n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial. And in that, you're also going to need the binomial theorem, which is where n choose k comes up. So the binomial theorem says you're going to take a to the power of n, and you're going to reduce this power by 1 for each term until 0. Similarly, you're going to start with b to the power of 0, and you're going to count upwards by 1 until n. And in that, you know that the exponents are always going to add to n. And the tricky part, the hard one to remember, is that you always need these coefficients here, this n choose k coefficient, where you're going to start where the k is always equal to the power of a. So this k and this power will always match. Okay, so using the power of the binomial theorem and combinations, can you show that these two expressions are indeed equivalent? So pause the video here. In the next slide, I'll walk through the solution. Okay, hopefully you had a moment to pause the video and you successfully showed our two definitions are equivalent. So let's run through a solution here that we're going to start with expanding this binomial. We get all of our 1 to the power of n with our powers counting down. The x over n term starting at a power of 0 and counting up and the n choose k, where k is identical to the power of 1. Okay, so from here we simplify. We know that 1 to every power is going to be 1, so you won't see any 1s written down here. And then this first term, some anything to the 0 power is of course 1, and n choose n is also 1. That's just one you should have memorized. If you want to think about it as a probability problem, trying to sort n objects into n columns. There's only one way to do that, and that is the way to do that. Also, you know for the next term, we have 1x over 1n. That's this term, 1x over 1n. And we also know that n choose n minus 1 is n. That's just another one to memorize. Or you can use the combinations formula to derive that, or you can look on Pascal's triangle and see the pattern where the second term is always equal to the, call, the row number. So from there, we're going to jump to the third term, where we see this n choose n minus 2. The 1, of course, cancels, and we're left with x squared over n squared. So this part's the x squared over n squared. This is our n choose k factorial. And what do we do with n factorial over n minus 2 factorial? Well, n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot dot dot. The n minus 2 dot 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 is n minus 2 factorial. So this n minus 2 factorial is going to cancel the n minus 2 dot 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 from the numerator, leaving only the n times n minus 1 term. Likewise, when we go to the next one, x cubed over n cubed, and the n choose k formula, what do we do with n factorial over n minus 3 factorial? Well, this is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 dot dot dot. Well, the n minus 3 dot 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 will cancel the n minus 3 factorial, leaving only the first three products. So from here, we see a pattern. What we're seeing is that after I do the elimination of n choose k and simplify, what I have is n, the power of n, is equal to the power of n in the denominator. And we're looking at the limit as n approaches infinity. So it's very important you carry that limit notation forward so you understand how to analyze this last step. Because by here, the n's will simplify, making it easy. 
but here the ends do not simplify. And without the limit step, you wouldn't know that this is 1. Because keep in mind, this is n squared minus n. But when looking at limits, we only care about the largest degree term. So n squared divided by n squared has a limit of 1. We can ignore the minus n here. So when we take the limit in this step, this appears to be 1, and we're left with x squared over 2 factorial. Very nice. Likewise, the largest degree term of this um, expansion is n cubed. And that n cubed divided by this n cubed as n approaches infinity will become 1. We ignore all the lower degree terms. And what's left is x cubed over 3 factorial. And this last one's a little tricky. But do know if you're multiplying n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot 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 dot. You are going to multiply n times n binomials. Which means the largest degree is n to the n. And that n to the n and this n to the n have a limit of 1. So that will just be the x to the n over the n factorial. Oh, this extra factorial is a typo. Go ahead and remove that. Okay, so what's nice about math is that you've actually known the series expansion for e to the x since you've also known about e as a concept. And you've probably known about e as a concept for a while up to this point. And it's just amazing that after years of knowing this definition of E, you magically end up at the Taylor or the McLaurin series expansion for E. And that's just one of the great things about math is how it constantly makes connections between itself and is always constantly spiraling at deeper levels. So it's just incredible. Um, moving forward, there is one all additional definition of E to the X using the integral, and I have it here. So you could also define E as the value of k such that this integral is satisfied. In other words, that this purple region has an area of 1 if k is e. And that's easy to show. You just take the antiderivative of 1 over x, which is the natural log of absolute value x, evaluated from 1 to k. And when you get k minus natural log 1, natural log 1 is 0, which means natural log k is 1, and therefore k is e. So as an extension question, we're not going to look at a solution here today, but it's just for fun, something to ponder. Is the integral definition for E consistent with the limit definition and now the series expansion? So that's something fun to play with. Hope you enjoy uh, the video, and I'll be back for more um, videos on the McLaurin series coming out soon. And our end goal is looking at this fascinating pi squared over 6 series that Euler arrived at. And we're going to be using the power of the McLaurin series to do that. So stay tuned, and we'll be looking at more in the next video. Thank you. Bye.